Hey guys, how you doing? I hope you're well. Excited to be with you tonight. Going to just jump on here and make sure I have a signal. Anyway, I hope you had a good day. I had such a busy day today that I could not get to you at 2.22 p.m. I am thinking about adding a day. We're thinking about changing the schedule a little bit. We will work on that together. So uh, let's get over here to Thomas McDaniels. Make sure we got some good audio going on. And yeah, I hope you had a good day. we I do have, have good audio going on. I hope you'll be there. Uh, hang on with me throughout the host session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm coming to you from the studio. We're also going to give a new, I get a new studio look soon. So we're going to change the studio a little bit and look excited, getting excited about that. So as many of you know, uh, this is Watchman's View and um, th this is all new for me. And, uh, you know, I had called one of my intercessor friends and very close friends and said, hey, pray for me. I need a lot of courage right now. So <laughs> not that I'm afraid by no means to share. I just don't feel confident in uh, what I'm doing. So I want to I want to just dive in for us to get on the same the same page. Uh, I am confident in the Lord. I'm confident in the spirit of God to do what he wants to do. And I'm confident that I am supposed to be doing Watchman's View. It, I, this all started two years ago. Uh, the Lord breathed this sentence to me. You are a watchman. Uh, I've shared the story with you that that means uh, a lot to me. It means uh, a lot of responsibility. It means a lot of care. It means a lot, primarily it means a lot of responsibility. And so I didn't really, I, when he breathed that to me, I was like, oh God, I don't know that I want that responsibility. As a, a pastor and a watchman are different because a pastor cares for a flock and watchmen care for a region and they care for everything that, and uh, you know, there are some things that apply to the flock that don't, that, don't, that don't apply to the region. And so the pastor anointing is about a flock and a group of people and you, the people you have relationships with, you're responsible for. And I did pastor a city in some ways, but I didn't feel responsible for the entire city. When God said uh, that I, he called me to a watchman anointing in the area I think that I, it's just like the, that the whole anointing went from this to this. And then I felt responsible to share. Um, and and the, the watchman is not responsible for what he sees. He's also not responsible for what he hears. He's only responsible for what he does see. In other words, he can't create what he sees. He can't miss what he sees. He can't create what he hears because God is the one who speaks to him. And God is the one who puts him in the position to see or God's in the spirit realm, shows him what he wants him to see. And that watchman is responsible for that. He's responsible to warn, to share, to scream out. Uh, it's like blowing a trumpet. They they blew, um, they had warnings that they blew. And, and also, um, this is, you know, it's not purely prophetic. Sometimes it's, it's what you see in the natural and what you discern. It's not like hearing God's voice and totally just hearing what he says and saying that. It's more like seeing what you see and how God uses what he sees. If I see a picture, just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all saw the same Jesus. They were all in the same stories, but there was different things that reflected out of their writings about who the Christ was. So in regard to this watchman's anointing and to share this watchman's view, and I want you to notice the words. The Lord literally gave me the name for what I'm doing here. Uh, the watchman's view. This is this is my view of what I'm seeing, hearing, impressed by, spiritually led by. Uh, I'm not hearing "Thus saith the Lord" necessarily. I'm I'm sensing the Lord is saying certain things. It's more impression than it is clarity. Um, so this is not purely prophetic. It's not purely. I'm not sitting here predicting. I'm not sitting here saying, thus saith the Lord. But I am seeing and sensing certain things. And the way that I've come to these, this, this moment of sharing these things with you, tonight I've got about 10 things. It sounds like a lot, but we're going to hang out together. And I won't be long, maybe 20 minutes. But uh, the way that I come up with these things is, for one thing, I spend the first, at least the first hour of every day, sometimes more, sometimes two, sometimes even three hours, just seeking God, listening, reading the word, putting on my YouTube worship, 
getting into the presence of the Lord, writing down notes, reading the scripture, writing down what I feel like are impressions from the scripture, writing down what I feel like are impressions from the spirit. Then I, what I feel like are impressions from the spirit, I will research, I will study out, I will, like what I did with this, with what I'm doing tonight, I, I had impressions, I wrote them down, wrote them down, wrote them down, and writing them down for a week. Uh, last night I went through some notes this morning, I spent an hour on the notes again, honing them out for what the Spirit is saying. So I want you to know, this is, this is not thus saith the Lord, it's not purely prophetic, and it's definitely not predictive. This is my watchman's view of what I see happening in the church, in my experiences, researching those moments out, and then sharing my view of those things with you. So that's where we're going tonight. I hope that I say something that's meaningful and helpful. I hope that, that my partners are watching. I hope that some of you are watching for the first time. Um, Watchmen of You will be a part at least once a week. I'm thinking about moving it to Tuesday and Thursday. I'll let you know about that in the coming weeks. Uh, but it won't be in the evening. It will be during the day. So that people can have all day. Most people watch YouTube at work. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. So number one tonight, here we go. I see and sense a shift in the church and the way we are doing church. I literally see a complete reformation for the local church in 2024. I'm saying that for a lot of reason. I, I definitely believe, and I think there are many will agree, if you're online, you can just type type agree in the, in, uh, in the text, in the um, comments, but I definitely believe we are seeing a greater intensity in the Holy Spirit in every church I have been in this year, and even the, the last quarter of last year and this year, there has been a greater intensity in the presence of the Lord everywhere I have gone. There's a greater intensity that for the Holy Spirit to touch leaders and for the churches that are hearing and that are responding, we are going to a fresh place of anointing, an increase in talent, an increase in spiritual gifts as well as gifts of musician, prophetic gifts, gifts to uh, display the glory of the Lord and definitely the presence of God. For the churches that respond, the glory will show up. For the churches that respond, the glory will show up. And I'm, I, I have been talking about the glory for two years now since I stepped down as this lead pastor of Life Ridge. I've been talking about, first I talked about stewarding the glory. This was the process that it came in. Uh, first it was being aware of the glory, then it was stewarding the glory, then it was then it was hosting the glory, and now I'm on to housing the glory. And the Lord, in the last two weeks, has given me some things about the glory. Uh, the things he's given me about the glory was, as one example that he gave me, that was the glory, was there was a glory on the tabernacle of Moses. There was a glory on the temple of Solomon. There was a glory on the tabernacle of David. But I want us to notice, which one did God say he was going to raise up? He said he was going to raise up the tabernacle of David. Why did he say that? Because I believe that the glory of God, I believe that David learned to host the glory and display the glory beyond what Moses and beyond what Solomon's temple could display. And I believe the reason that God chose the tabernacle of David to be raised up in these last days is because they learned how to host the glory and they knew how to display the glory, meaning through worship and through anointed worship. What did God say he was raising up? The tabernacle of David. Why? Because it was about the host. Now, I want to I want to talk to you about the host. And this is what, as I have been seeking the Lord, 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 how do we host your glory? Lord, how do we host your glory? Pastor Brian said something amazing last night. He said he was talking about honor, that God comes in where there's honor. And that's very true. He, we enter his courts with praise. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. That's the entrance of how we get into his presence. And then where there is the honor, when God brings his presence, how we honor him. In other words, this is the word host, all right? What is, I am a host of the Holy Spirit. I am a host. And, when, and, I, and the Lord began to share it with me that as the, the body of Christ, learns how the host, we, learn how to, to display his holiness, to live in his holiness, to honor his holiness, to honor his presence, to, to prepare for his presence with holiness by 
Psalm 24, lifting up holy hands and having a clean heart. This is the host of the glory. And when the host are in purity, the glory can be on display. David was a man after God's own heart. He had a contrite heart and a broken spirit. He was sincere and transparent, not perfect. Perfectly transparent, perfectly sincere. I believe for the church that is transparent and sincere and that hosts the glory and that is ready to honor the presence of God by scrapping the way they've been doing church like we did last night at Lightbridge Christian Center and setting their agendas aside and setting their pastoral pleasures aside to be known greater than Jesus was known, the churches that begin to set aside their schedule for the presence of God are going to be to, to going to see a reformation and the church is going to change like never before. And that church, those churches will host the last day harvest. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Number two, there will be a release of the supernatural power of the Lord. We have entered a season of great signs and wonders. We do not want to miss the opportunities as we are not as we are at LifeBridge, as we are at Network 411, as we are in all the churches, as we are at Living Room Worship, as we are where, where, everywhere I'm going to church, everywhere I'm connected, and everywhere people that are connected to me, we are praying for the sick. We are casting out demons. We are watching the Lord display his might and his power. Why? Because worship and his presence is first. And when he comes in, there's no limitations to what can happen. So I declare that we're going to see a release of the supernatural power of God in the local church and even on the streets. I also believe there's going to be an ascending of the remnant. Number three, an ascending of a remnant in the USA. There's an unrelenting remnant that refuses to come down off the wall of intercession, declarations, decrees on behalf of the beloved church and of these beleaguered nations. I believe with all my heart that there is a remnant that is rising up. There is a remnant that's giving their life away. There's a remnant, even if you're behind closed doors and you may be single and you're an intercessor. And I know several single men who are living for God and they spend their days in prayer. And I'm telling you, God is raising up a remnant like we have never seen before. And I'm praying that you will be a part of that remnant. You're no longer going to live for yourself. You're no, gonna, no longer going to live for money and wealth and significance and success, but you're going to begin to live for the kingdom of God in every day. That's going to be your purpose and your focus. That is the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom that we all need to be living for. Number four, the third great awakening. I believe there's a great transformative outpouring of the Holy Spirit coming around the world, including a global harvest. The body of increases is increasing on the earth faster than the world's population. This includes Israel and a number of of Muslim nations. There are there are a number of Muslims coming to Christ. There are numbers of Israelis coming to Christ. We are going to see a global harvest like we've never seen before. That may come through some difficulty. It may come because of hard times. It may come because of the supply lines that are cut off. It may come out of desperation, but however it comes, we are going to see, and it is a part of the end days, that there is a global harvest coming in. We will also see, and this is B under our A under four, we will see local revivals in places that are honoring God and honoring his presence. There's no one place that's going to see this, but there's going to be many cities, some unreported, that's going to have revival. They're going to have revival, local revivals, to the strength of the reality that all they can do is what they can do. They're not, they're not putting it online because they can't fill up their churches. They don't want people flogging, flogging to their cities, but they are going to have local revival. In other words, like LifeBridge Christian Center may go from 1,000 to 2,000, and other churches in the city may go from 2,000 to 3,000. But I believe the churches that are honoring God that are seeking him, that are letting him move and letting him have his way, we are going to see an outpouring of revival on those churches and they are going to grow through local revival, through daily prayer meetings, through worship nights and through the local church. And I'm not trying to throw out the local church. Discipleship, small groups, fellowship, being together, all those things are vital. Let's don't throw nothing out no, nothing away that's biblical in this whole thing. If we have a global harvest, we need global discipleship. If we have a global salvation, we need global baptisms. In other words, to the measure they're coming in, we need to disciple them, baptize them, get them in the local body, get them into small groups, disciple them into 
Christ. And then I believe, number five, the judgment of leaders with the king's position who have failed to repent to the word of, that God has made clear. I'm going to say that again. There's going to be a judgment on leaders, government, governmental leaders that are in king's positions. I'm saying prime ministers, presidents, chancellors of nations, whatever that looks like. I don't know, kings like over in Europe. All I'm trying to say is the people that are in king's positions, that there's going to be judgment on them and if unless they repent of the word of the Lord that God has made clear to them. In other words, the leaders that are rejecting the word of the Lord or making decisions beyond what God has said or making unrighteous decisions, those leaders are going to come under the judgment of God. That might be correction. It might be discipline. It might be more than that. I don't know. But I do know that we must be intercessors for our current president and our current vice president because I believe they're making choices against righteousness and I believe those choices are obvious. I also believe if there's anything prophetic for me tonight, this is it. And that is, and God breathed this to me this morning. I heard this clearly. God is going to reveal himself to Donald Trump in greater ways and call him higher into his faith than he's ever been called into before. I'm not predicting he will be the president. I'm not predicting he will not be the president. I am predicting that he will have a moment with God that is significant. He will display that and let people know that, not for the purpose of winning an election, but I believe that God is calling him higher into his faith than he's ever been before. Now, for the rest of what I want to share tonight, for you tonight is, is through study, it's through research, and it's through prayer, lots of prayer. So number six, the pressure against Israel and Netanyahu will be relentless and unprecedented. Netanyahu will soften his stand, but he will continue to be assaulted, persecuted, and attacked from within. Israel will collapse governmentally until another devastating attack occurs. In other words, I believe that Netanyahu is going to back up too far. They are going to stop the momentum of what they're doing with Hamas and that they are going to come to the point where they're going to be governmentally stalled and collapsed. Netanyahu is going to come under severe persecution and attack. They're going to try to remove him from office. I don't know the outcome of that, but I do know that there is an, there will be another attack on Israel, probably most likely from Hezbollah, and I'm not just saying that, but it may be from Syria. It may be from Iran, Iran themselves that will cause them to go back into war. I think we need to pray for Netanyahu, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and our Congress and our senators like we've never prayed before. This is not the end. This is not the end. This is not Armageddon yet. This is the beginning of birth pains and the beginning of sorrows. I truly believe that 2024 is going to be a year of challenge. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be like every month. And this is what the, how the Lord, this is how the Lord breathed this to me in the last hour. It's going to be like, like how we look at how we look at January 1 and we and we're looking at goals and we're looking at plans. And we're every month's going to be a shift. And every month's going to be like a January. Like, okay, we got a shift because this happened. Okay, we got a shift because this happened. Okay, we got to we got to refresh because this happened. Okay, we got to change because this happened. And I believe that we are going to be challenged to the place where we're going to be suffering from fear. Here's what the world the Lord said to me: the world is shaking and the heavenlies are hemorrhaging. This will continue until summer and circumstances will look bleak and fear will be the enemy that multitudes in a nation will be forced to defeat. I want to say it again. This will continue until summer and the circumstances will look bleak and fear will be an enemy that multitudes in the nations will be forced to defeat. That's probably going to be us. I am calling the remnant to watch and pray. Fear is going to be big and will cripple many saints in America. Fear is more, is more, is fear is the more, here's what the Lord said to me. Fear is the more significant culprit than the actual events themselves, but the events will be catastrophic and alarming. I don't want to, I don't want you to be af afraid. The Lord doesn't want you to be afraid. I'm not afraid. I only know that when, when you watch the television and you watch F-16s fly off of a deck and you watch bombs fall out of the air and you watch Palestinian children 
die because of bombs flying and you watch nations and, and all this stuff happening and you realize this is getting closer to home and closer to home and closer to home, then we have to realize fear is going to be a factor. We're not in the last days yet. We're in the last days, but we're not in the end of days. Be ready. It's, it's birth pains. It's the beginning of sorrows. But the end, like Jesus said, the end is not yet. Here's a little report. Brett, Joe Biden said yesterday he has decided how to respond to Sunday's attack on the military base in Jordan that killed three U.S. troops. You may not even know about this situation. In reply, Iran, Iran threatened this morning to decisively respond to any U.S. attack. Here's one reason and one thing that's overlooked by many. Why Iran's role in this escalating conflict should concern us is this. Here's what most of you don't know, and this may be new for you. If you don't know about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it is an alliance led by Russia and China. The partnership enables Iran to engage in commerce and trade arms more freely with both nations. Listen to me. BRICS is in place. They have cut the United States out of that. That's Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is the out of that. They're, they're, they're Muslim, but they're not communist. But they're doing this to trade. They're no longer trading with the American dollar, which is going to take billions out of our economy. But more than that, they cut the United States out of that. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is led by Russia and China together. What are they doing? Let me read it to you. As the Center of Iranian Studies notes, Iran's military strategy now aligns with the strategic inclinations of Beijing-Moscow alliance. Remember, Ezekiel 37 and 38 is all about Russia and China against Israel and, some, and Turkey's involved in those nations and, and a nation in Africa. We know that Iran is already at war with Israel through the proxies. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, the West Bank, and Yemen are all under a proxy of Iran, and they are all battling uh, Israel on some front and in some way. CIA Director William Burns says in Foreign Affairs yesterday, the Iranian regime has been emboldened by the crisis, expanding its nuclear program, and enabling Russian aggression along with them. Vladimir Putin is massively boosting military spending this year and ramping up production of hardware from drones to aircraft in order to evade, invade even farther and possible uh, war with NATO. In response to Russia's aggressions, NATO is presently conducting its largest military exercise in decades. The chairman of the military committee recently told reporters, we are preparing for a conflict with Russia. In other words, NATO, which is the NATO nations, and Russia are both preparing for a conflict. If Russia goes past Ukraine, into Poland, into other areas, NATO's going to come in and we're going to have war. But listen, again, I'm just, I'm wanting you to know. I'm wanting you to catch the urgency. I'm wanting you to catch, but while at the same time, know that God is doing something in the spirit realm that's beautiful, wonderful, and powerful, preparing us for the conflict in the heavenlies where the hemorrhaging is going on. Meanwhile, Iran's other strategic partner, China, is intensifying military pressure on Iran. Here's the close. Iran, Russia, and China share one commonality. They are declining economically and demographically. They need each other to stand and defeat the United States. Neither, none of them can defeat America alone. But bigger is the alignment of nations for the coming of the Antichrist. Folks, listen to me. We serve a king. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for the Christ. We are experiencing some of the greatest spiritual moments of our life. Notice, while the hemorrhaging of the nations are going on. Psalm chapter 2 is in full display. The nations are in a rage while the king is laughing. Not because it's funny, because he knows that they cannot defeat Israel and they will not defeat any, any, any nation that blesses Israel. That's why we need to pray for Joe Biden to stay in allegiance with Israel. That's why we need to stay in our watch, stay on our towers, stay at our post, stay in our local churches, make a difference, get ready for revival, make a difference in revival, go to more worship services than ever, pray like we've never prayed before, 
believe like we never believed before, stand up, make a difference, be the remnant that I called you to be earlier in this cast. I'm believing that for all of us. I'm believing that we're not going to be afraid. I'm believing we're going to watch God win these battles. I believe I'm going to be on my watch perch. I'm going to be at my post, like Haggai, like Habakkuk said. I will be at my post. I will stand and watch and wait to see what he says to me. All I'm going to do is do what I'm doing. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep studying. I'm going to keep researching. I'm going to keep, and I'm going to keep opening my mouth for what I hear. And I share my watchman's view with you and pray that makes a difference to us on a local level. I'm not trying to create a nationwide TV show or go any wider than serving East Texas and you. That's what I want to do. I want to put out the word for us in this region. I, I love the nations. I don't feel called to the nations. I feel called to Longview. I feel called to East Texas. I feel called to serve pastors. I feel called to be a voice and a watchman on the wall that serves other people. And that's what I'm going to keep doing till I can no longer, till I no longer have any breath. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing this video. If I made a difference in anything, if you agree with anything, please, I'll take your encouragement. When you get out, when you get this transparent and you get on these prophetic edges, you just want to know at least you're helping somebody. Because when you take these risks, you feel so vulnerable. So I'm believing God's going to grow this gift. I believe he's going to speak to me more clearly. I believe he's going to start saying to me things that I can say that will make a difference and that will come true. And the Lord has used me that way before. Uh, but for right now, I'm growing in this gift. I'm growing in this moment. And I'm, I'm transitioning in to what God has called me to do with, with my partners, with the pastors in this region, and right here with the Watchman's View. I hope I've been a blessing to you. Please leave me a comment. Please share the video. And I'll see you next time right here next Thursday at 2.22 in the afternoon. I'll see you here, if not before. Bless you.